That has to do with the ages. Yeah. You know what? In that thing of, uh, of the perception, it's really an important thing for us to identify happiness in ourselves and others and be sure you compliment people on it. <laughs> yeah. We become an agent of uh, spreading the word. But you're right. And life is about joy. And this brings up for me uh, the American Declaration of Independence. Uh, the, the one thing that America needs to do and that everyone needs to do is discover what dream is their nation. Yeah. Without a defined dream, a nation falters. The American dream didn't come from Europe. It came from the native people here. And it was, curiously, it's on the dollar bill, but they have it backwards. And the, I'll even put it in Latin, make it sound European. The true American, true American dream is this. Onuit septis, renovatio ordinis seculorum, a pluribus unum, od in Deo et in nobis, semper confitemur. Translation? Anuit means to nod with approval, but I prefer to say, for the divinity has breathed with approval upon the things we have begun, a renewal of the ancient order of affairs, <clears throat> that out of many should be one, in order that in the divinity and each other we may forever trust. That's a nation. It's trust that makes a nation. And when you, people are happy, they trust each other. That's one of the reasons for being happy. And without that trust, the nation is only a theory. So uh, I propose, that is the golden age. That's the way the nations of the Americans, who were here before the white men, that was their dream. They trust, trusted each other. They loved each other. They were empowered. They lived in joy. They celebrated life every day. And when we came here, unfortunately, we took it away from them. We had no respect for that. And yet, it got on a dollar bill, but all backwards. It got on there with Hitler's idea instead of the right one. It was new order. New order of affairs, right? Here's the way it reads on the dollar bill. For the divinity has nodded approval upon the things we have begun. A new order of affairs, that out of many should be one, in order that in God alone we may trust. Well, that's not good enough. <laughs> it's not a new order. It's a very ancient one the order of the golden age. It's implicit in us. Let us begin to dream that dream that we should in a, live in a world in which trust is normative. The other day, a Chinese man came from China to do business, and he said, you Americans have too much paperwork with all your stuff. <laughs> all main papers, papers, papers. He said, in China, we still work on a handshake. And I said, well, now that's a pretty potent nation. If China's going to win, that's why they're going to win, because they trust each other. And we're going to lose because we don't. <laughs> so it's a matter of national survival. And the greatest of all patriotic duties is to be happy and learn to trust the people around you and help them to trust you as well. So that's the sort of United Nations thing, isn't it? And you were talking about the uh, mm. about so much about happiness, and then you mentioned the Declaration of Independence. Where I thought you were going was life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Which I was, is, but know, I didn't get there. <laughs> which is such an integral part. Uh, it was supposed to be, I think, an integral part of our beginnings, but got lost somewhere. Yes, I I like to say. The pursuit of happiness is not quite the right statement. 
pursuit of the sense of the meaning of life. We can't define the meaning of life, but we have the sense of it, or we don't. And when we have the sense of the meaning of life, we're happy. And when we don't, there's something missing. And so we should operate to get that sense. And listen to what it says. You hold these truths to be self-evident that all human beings are created equal and endowed by their creator with an inalienable, inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of the sense of the meaning of life. Wouldn't that be about perfect? Yeah. <laughs> and there it is in the American Declaration of Independence. They didn't get it from Europe. They got it from the native people. The Celts used to have it, but that got buried by Julius Caesar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that you came up with another uh, broadening of our vision, namely, let's look uh, uh, into this. And maybe if we have a good number of good years, we are getting better up to, to heaven, no? <laughs> yes, and the thing is, again, remember that your heart is moved by the gravity grace of the sun. For sure, and oh, you yes. know, that that's really true? You're right. I had a lady one time who was afflicted by winter. And whenever winter came, she would just be so depressed. And so I said to her, Claire, why don't you go to Australia in the winter and have summer all the time and you'll be happy. She said, oh, that's a good idea. So off she went to Australia. And she, I said, did it work? She said, yeah, because you get my winter depression. <laughs> and I said to her, well, good, but do it again this year? No, I don't think I'll stay here. And I said, don't do it, Claire, you'll be sorry. And darned if something strange didn't happen. I went to India that year, and I came back to New York and had to go up to Lake Placid. And I was up there visiting a boy that I'd raised who was in school there. And uh, when I came back, I find that Claire had died in New York State while I was there from forgetting to leave the country in the winter, it killed her. And I thought, oh my Lord. Yes, we must have mercy on each other. Yes, winter is a hard time, not just physically, but spiritually. That's why Christmas is such a great day. It isn't Christmas, it's winter solstice. When the sun rises from the dead on the 25th of December, having been in the tomb for three days. Does that sound familiar? Now, uh, this rising of the sun, Chris, that day is sacred because we all feel the change. The sun isn't diminishing anymore, it isn't dying. It's rising from the dead. Yes, we're getting set free here. It's the grace gravity of the stars. Come on, guys, this is big stuff. It is true. We are moving in the heavens. Yeah. We are citizens of an eternity. We are there in the midst of forces so great we cannot imagine them, and yet they move us every day. <laughs> yeah, right? we have not. Uh, we are not taking cognizance of uh, the the role of the sun in everything that happens on this planet. That's There's right. There's no doubt. That's right. It's uh, people don't think about that. No. They look at the summer. Uh, the sun for the summertime and the beach, and that's about it. Yes. You are right, that's a very important phenomenon. It is. And uh, this cross that I wear here is a solar cross. And this cross is 550 years old. Oh my. <laughs> and it comes from Mexico before Cortez. It's the Veracruz, the true cross that he saw upon posts all along the coast. And this is also a diagram of the ziggurat of Ur. It's two paths of the sun, the blue path by day and the red path by year. And where they cross is the violet flame. And this sun symbol is totally involved in all the original religions of the world in which they saw the sun and the stars as the intermediaries of divine grace. And that the power of them to attract your heart and to let you down, and that power 
is the power that comes from the manifesting power of the universe through the stars to your heart. Call that the love of God, wouldn't you? <laughs> but look at it, it's measurable. It's scientific. That's very it's important. Experiential. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Not yeah. something you have to believe in. It's knowledge. Yeah. Oh, wow. No doubt. Yes. <laughs> Gives God a good reputation, no doesn't doubt. it? <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, that's male orientation. You know, uh, the female has much more heart stuff in it, whether it's male or female female. Yep. And the thing is, I have a, a thing about that, very much about that, which has to do with the, uh, the estrogen and the testosterone and the, and the progesterone. Now, when a boy goes through puberty, his testosterone goes up 75 times, which makes him a warrior, right? When a woman goes through puberty, her estrogen goes up five times. Estrogen is almost as dangerous of testosterone, but she gets a lot less of it, so she's not quite so ferocious. But nonetheless, the one we want is the progesterone. Progesterone makes a mother. It makes the mother put the child's welfare ahead of her own. Without that, the human race would not survive. And what I suggest is that we all need lots of progesterone. And we need, we need to get a new miracle drug out here that does what progesterone does. And we need to make it legally required to drink a glass of it every morning. And the world would then go out and be cured of its problems in a second. Because, <laughs> male or female, I call it progesterone proclivity. And what I say is, we should require that it be taken every day. Because progesterone proclivity portends the peace of the world and the happiness of all. Because happiness comes from ecstasy. And the two words are almost interchangeable. And ecstasy is the only dependable motive of conduct of every sentient being in the universe. And what progesterone does is make you realize the rules for ecstasy, which are simple. <laughs> Get your ecstasy by giving it away, and the world shall be well. Never take it without giving it first. Oh, well now, that's a good idea. And we even have the, the drug in us, the hormone in us, and we all have a little progesterone. We need a lot more. <laughs> so uh, that, that's sort of a, maybe the United Nations should talk about that. <laughs>